Distraction is the biggest enemy of your productivity. As a test, try to watch this video until the very end without clicking off. The video doesn't last even 10 minutes. Yet, it takes at least 23 minutes to get fully involved in the process of work after you've lost concentration for even a moment. Well, to be precise, it's actually 1,395 seconds. So, to start being really productive, make your workplace as non-distracting as possible. Don't try to multitask. Chances are you won't complete anything challenging if you're scrolling your social media feed simultaneously. So turn on silent mode or even fright mode to stop notifications, and once you've started working, don't take a short every 10 minutes break. Now, what if your brain just won't do anything hard? Give it a workout! The best way to really jumpstart your gray matter is to use all five senses simultaneously. Go to a farmer's market or have lunch at that nice restaurant you wanted to visit. Food is a great way to activate all your senses, which involves different parts of your brain. You'll trigger your sense of smell and taste, sight and hearing and touch, and your brain will feel refreshed and ready to work. Looking for a way to trick yourself into being productive? A competitive spirit can help. A simple contest, even ones like who loses more pounds this month, always makes people more productive than usual. Another trick to begin difficult things is to eat a frog first thing in the morning. Sounds chic, like French cuisine. But really, it means to do your biggest and hardest tasks first. Because when you leave the hard stuff for later, you stress over it, which makes you less productive. To reward yourself after any unpleasant frog eating, treat yourself to some watermelon. They beat fatigue. A banana can be great, too. Sometimes the hardest part is to just start your tasks. Lie to yourself when you begin and tell yourself that as you finish this task, you'll be done working for the day and you'll go to the movies with an extra-large popcorn or another reward. When you finish the task, chances are you won't go to the movies and will continue working instead. Don't choose feed scrolling as a reward, though. 15 minutes online seems harmless, but scrolling gets your dopamine, a neurotransmitter that makes us feel pleasure, to an excessive level. This causes addiction and makes everything else seem boring. So, the more you reward yourself with social media when a task is accomplished, the harder it will be to complete the next one. 20 minutes of exercise is a perfect reward for your body and mind. Exercise sets your dopamine to a normal level. Physical activity pumps more blood to your brain. Your muscles may be tired after a workout, but you're going to be more focused than ever. Exercise helps our body produce essential neurotransmitters, such as endorphins and serotonin. Oh, by the way, even the simplest house chores count as exercise. <laughs> Maybe it's high time you dusted the shelves. If you're having trouble learning something new, you should try to teach it. You'll have to explain the concept, and you'll find any mistakes you might make, too. Suppose you're struggling with a challenging math topic. Try watching a YouTube video and then inviting a friend over to teach it to them. Five hours of cramming and still no result? Maybe it's too quiet. Crank up some good tunes that will fire up your creativity and help you find the solution faster. Melodic instrumentals are the best choice. It increases dopamine levels by up to 9%. Some companies that introduced music as part of their corporate culture claim that staff productivity got 40% higher. Whenever you feel demotivated facing a massive task, try not to do everything at once. Split it into several subtasks. First, write a plan, set the key points, write the speech, and then think of a presentation. Don't forget the reward system, you know, cuddle your cat or eat a piece of cake. When you accomplish any of the tasks, reward yourself by releasing some dopamine. Spring cleaning your mind may be an excellent way to trick it into being more productive. The right food can be the best way to refresh your brain. Our brain needs fatty acids to oxygenate, so fish, nuts, and seeds are the fuel your brain might want. 
A good night's sleep is also a must for feeling good. But if you need to boost your brain activity right here and right now, try a power nap. Only 45 to 60 minutes are enough. Yeah, this one probably sounds like a poor sleep habit, but it actually increases brain activity and improves your memory. Research showed that people who were allowed to have a quick hour-long nap managed to recall new words more easily than those who watch DVDs instead. An excellent way to train your brain is to draw a map. From memory, map the city you live in, assuming it's not Monoway, a town with a population of one. Include significant streets and places of interest. If it seems too easy, draw the US map, including all states. It boosts your memory, creativity, and activates different areas of the brain. Use your non-dominant hand to increase brain activity. Try switching hands while having lunch, scratching your back, or when grabbing a snack from the fridge. Even brushing your teeth seems complicated when you change hands. The more you do it, the more alive your brain will be. One more quick activity is to name two objects that start with each letter of your first or last name. So, if you're Mike, you can have a monkey, mud, iceberg, igloo, kettle, kid, elephant, and eel. Too easy? Reorder the months in the alphabetical order. You'll start with April, then December, and so on. Do it without pen and paper to make it a real challenge. Still too easy? Try reverse alphabetical order. Just a hint, September comes first. Here's a brain workout you can do right now. Set your stopwatch for 60 seconds and study these eight unrelated words. Chair, dentist, shoes, cabbage, squirrel, door, horseshoe, jug. Now take a break and do something else for 10 minutes. Then try to remember the words. Here's another one for right now. Look around and find five green objects and five red objects. This trains your brain and your eyes. Let's try another game to boost your brain energy. Here's the word tall. The task is to change one letter at a time until the word tall turns into the word sail. Answer? Tall, fall, fail, sail. Be kind to your short-term memory. We all have our limits, so just take quick notes whenever you need to remember something important. Hey, you made it through to the end of the video! Watch at least 23 minutes of our videos to really boost your brain and get fully involved in the bright side. So did you know you only use 10% of your brain? Well, sorry, that's not true. People use almost 100% of it almost all the time. So what's holding you back? Why can't we learn languages faster, multiply big numbers in our head, or understand quantum physics? Maybe because of all of the limitations we humans put on ourselves. Have you ever said to yourself, I'm not smart enough to solve that math problem? Or I'm not good enough to get into that college? As soon as you say those kinds of things, you're programming yourself to fail. Every single one of us is capable of doing anything we set our mind to. In 1954, Roger Bannister was the first person ever to run a mile in less than 4 minutes. For centuries before that, everyone thought it was impossible. People said your heart would explode if you ran that fast. But Bannister did it, barely, in 3 minutes and 59 seconds. Just 2 months later, another athlete did it too, 1.5 seconds faster. The latest record stands at 3 minutes, 43 seconds, 17 seconds, faster than we ever imagined was possible. A lot of your limitations are in your head. You don't really know what you're capable of. Your brain is like a supercomputer. It does what you tell it to do. Don't forget to give it inspiring commands. That's what athletes, CEOs, and brain surgeons do every day. Have you ever been so interested in something that you lost track of time, didn't check your cell, didn't feel the need to eat, sleep, breathe? Hours passed, but you didn't notice. You were just so into what you were doing. Happens to me when I'm practicing music. It's not a very common state, but it probably happened to you at least once in your life. Let's get real. It feels 
perfect. Imagine if you could live in this state most of the time. With breaks to eat and sleep, of course, humans still need to meet their basic survival needs. But imagine if you could be in this state every time you study, work, do your favorite hobby. You'd be the world's most productive person. You could probably graduate high school at 14 and become a CEO before your 20th birthday. You could have already written a handful of novels by now. It's not science fiction. Your mind really does have the power to be extremely productive and creative. And, it turns out, you can actually turn this skill on in your brain all by yourself. The psychologist who discovered it was a curious guy. Why do some people, like artists, keep creating masterpieces even if it doesn't bring them money or fame? Their art still makes them feel happy, and they don't want to find another more profitable profession. The psychologist wanted to interview these people. Finally, a composer told him that when he writes music, he falls into a mental state where he doesn't want anything else in the world. Just doing his thing gives him so much fulfillment that he doesn't need any reward, money, applause, you name it. Other people described the same exact phenomenon. The psychologist called it flow. Here's what it feels like. You're completely immersed in what you're doing. You're so focused on it, you don't get distracted by anything. You're 100% excited by what you're doing. The reason behind it is actually pretty simple. The human brain can only perceive 110 bits of information per second. For example, listening to a person talking takes up about 60 bits. That's why it's almost impossible to listen to two people talking about two totally different things at the exact time. But what you can do is listen to someone and do something easy like listen to music, check your cell phone, answer texts, play with your hair, or even just think about the weather. When you reach flow, the activity you're doing takes up all 110 bits of attention. So you have nothing left over to spend on any other activities. The world around you just seems to disappear. You don't even pay attention to your basic needs like eating or sleeping. Above all, you feel confident. No doubts at all, you can do it. Whatever it is, you know you can. Plus, the more you do it, the more inspiration you get. You lose track of time. Hours go by, but you don't even notice, and you definitely don't feel tired. When you're reading a book, the words come alive. When you're playing music, it's like you can hear your instrument talking to you. When you're running, it's as if the whole world around you is in surround sound HD. Well, that does sound great, but how do you activate it? It all depends on two things. The first one is how much of a challenge you feel. The other one's your skill set. Depending on the level of each factor, you're going to exist in a different state. Let's say you're doing some second-grade math homework. Okay, you're not Einstein, but you have some math skills. The homework is too easy and isn't a challenge at all, so you get bored. Now, imagine you just got a new job. You have some skills, but your boss gives you an impossible task on your first day. This time, the challenge is too big, so you start to feel anxious. Flow is somewhere in between. It's a world where you have a lot of skills, but also a lot of challenges. The work's hard, but you have confidence in your skills. Here are the steps you should take to get into your very own flow state. Pick the right time. Think about the time when you're usually most productive. Maybe early morning, middle of the day. Maybe way past midnight. It's different for everyone. Are you exhausted, sad, stressed, angry, or hungry? If you are, it's not going to work. Make sure you're loaded with energy and feeling good. If you're not, you'll just keep getting distracted. Put your phone away, turn off the TV, and close the door. If you can get distracted glancing at a cute kitty pic your friend sent you, it can take you about 25 minutes to completely forget about it and concentrate back on your task. Mute your phone and clean your desk so you don't get the urge to do it later. Grab all the stuff you're going to need so you don't have to get up and disrupt your flow. Now, pick out what you're actually gonna do. Remember, to get into the flow, you should be doing something that you're very skilled at something that gives you a challenge. But sorry people, you can't achieve flow in every activity. It's gotta be something you're already really, really good at. 
scientists now think we need 10,000 hours of practice to become truly amazing at something. That's 3 hours a day, every day, for just over 9 years. Pick something challenging, something that gives you the chance to grow. If you pick something way too easy, you'll get bored right away. But don't overdo it. If the task is too hard for you, you won't reach that sweet flow. Come up with a specific task. This helps you focus your mind and stops you from spacing out. It can be writing a story, finishing a painting, coming up with a business plan, whatever. Just make sure you know what the goal is. When you're ready, you can start working. But it's not going to happen right away. It's like a sport. You need to warm up a bit first. It usually takes about 15 minutes of solid focus to get into a flow state. And don't be sad if it doesn't happen the first time. Just keep trying it as often as possible. It's the most productive thing you'll ever be, and maybe even the most happy. It's very possible that we humans came up with our best ideas while being in full flow mode. That's when composers dreamt up their best music, writers wrote their best novels, and sportswomen set world records. About 60-80% to of people, mostly aged 15-25, to occasionally have goosebump-inducing deja vu moments. It's fleeting and unpredictable. And scientists are still not 100% sure why it happens and can't control it. To understand it better, they tried to create memories for patients under hypnosis. Then, they asked them to forget or remember the memory, and it made them experience deja vu later. Other scientists tried to recreate it in virtual reality with scenes and games that looked alike. The experiments made them believe deja vu is your memory playing tricks on you. You get into a situation that's similar to a real memory that you have, but you can't remember it completely. Your brain notices the similarities and leaves you with a strange feeling of already seen. That's how deja vu translates from French. Another version is that it's a memory glitch. It's more likely to happen when you're stressed. When you're under pressure or have a lot of information to process at once, some of it can end up in long-term memory instead of short-term memory. It could also be the result of a sudden electrical discharge of neurons in the brain that creates false connections. One guy had the chronic version of deja vu and felt stuck in a time loop for eight years. He even stopped watching TV, listening to the radio, and reading newspapers because he always felt like he had seen it all before. Each episode lasted for minutes and it felt like living in a weird movie. His brain scans looked normal, though, so it must have been a psychological issue. Between 40 and 60% of people experience the opposite of deja vu. It's the feeling when you don't recognize a well-familiar setting, like the house you grew up in or a person. A word you've known your entire life can also suddenly seem strange, and even your own face in the mirror. If your second cousin claims he's an expert in geography, and then argues Paris is the capital of Italy at a family party, he's probably driven by the Dunning-Kruger effect. People who are incompetent in something aren't able to assess their skill level. They refuse to recognize their own mistakes and the expertise of other people. It happens because you need the same knowledge and skills to be good at something as to recognize you aren't good at it. Even a tiny bit of knowledge can sometimes make you believe you're an expert at something. The more you study the subject, the more you realize there's still a lot to learn. That's why people who know a lot about something often underestimate their skills and doubt what they know. So, when in doubt, ask other people you trust for feedback. Horoscopes and personality test results often feel as if they were written just about you because of the Barnum effect. Your brain fills in the gaps in vague and general statements that could be true for anyone to make you link them with your life. It works especially well with positive statements, as your brain normally treats negative ones more skeptically. Entertainment websites and apps now use this effect to sell you so-called personalized products. When you have a bad hair day or an oil stain on your white shirt, you're sure everyone is staring at you because of the spotlight effect. 
When you're focused on something, your brain makes you believe everyone else is focused on that as well. You're naturally the center of your own universe, and you see the world through your experiences and perspective. Others do the same, so don't worry about that stain. When you're eating out before an important job interview, you may feel like everyone in the room knows exactly how nervous you are at that moment. This brain trick is called the illusion of transparency. It's caused by the same reasons as the spotlight effect. A good way to get over it is to remember others don't have full access to your thoughts and feelings, and they can't read your mind. The halo effect is the reason why you judge someone's actions based on how much you like them. When you find someone good looking, your brain often makes a conclusion that they're also smart and nice. When a person is positive and enthusiastic at work, it can often overshadow their lack of skills and make others see them as better professionals than they really are. When you dislike someone, everything about them, like the way they speak or chew, drives you nuts. As negative episodes connected with that person pile up, the related neural connections in your brain become stronger and make you only focus on all the bad that they do. The brain even distorts facts about them to fit your view and blinds you from noticing the good things that they do. Confirmation bias makes you look for confirmation of what you believe in everything. You gather information, selectively ignoring even the obvious facts that oppose your existing ideas. That's why when you're browsing the internet, you're more likely to notice materials that support your opinion on the matter. It's a way for your brain to somehow sort and process limitless amounts of information surrounding you. Plus, knowing that your point of view is accurate helps your self-esteem. Anchoring is a mind trick that makes you stick to the first impression of someone or something and affects your decisions. When you see a $10 frappuccino on top of the menu at a coffee shop, a $5 Americano seems like a bargain. You get it without thinking it's still too much, because the first price you saw was way higher. To stop anchoring from forcing you into bad decisions, you got to find more info and weigh all the options. When an emergency happens and you expect someone else to step in and help, that's the bystander effect in action. The more bystanders are around, the less chance there is any of them will do something. It makes you feel less personal responsibility. Because of social influence, you look at others and copy their behavior of doing nothing. If you say, oh, I'm mad you're here, instead of, oh, I'm glad you're here, that's a classic Freudian slip. They're real windows into your unconscious mind. They happen mostly when you're tired or emotionally overwhelmed. Your brain takes advantage of it and tricks you into saying what you're most scared to say. Your brain will always convince you you fail because of reasons outside your control. You got bad test results because your dog never stopped barking and didn't let you study. You broke that vase because your phone rang and scared you. All these made-up excuses are your brain's attempt to protect your self-esteem and stop your fear of failure. When you succeed at something, you always believe it's the result of your skills and efforts. Even if it was by accident, your brain will convince you you completely deserve it. Declinism is the official term for remembering the past better than it was and seeing the present and the future in overly negative light. It makes you believe things are worse now than they once used to be. TV and media are partially to blame for this. You get to see tons of negative and shocking news, which confirms your beliefs the present is scary and the future uncertain. It also happens because of the old survival instinct. To pass on genes, people constantly had to watch out for threats and dangers. When your new colleague leaves the flash drive with a group project at home, you conclude she's a bad and irresponsible person. When you do the same, it's because of some unfortunate circumstances. That's fundamental attribution error. You explain mistakes of others with their bad personality and your own with some external factors. Your memory doesn't work like a video camera that records every moment exactly like it happened. It's way more fragile and inaccurate. It's rather easy to distort someone's memories or even create false ones. It can be as easy as showing someone a video they didn't take part in 
to make them believe they were there. You also forget a lot of information, from useless everyday details to important stuff. A forgetful brain works like a filter that sorts out painful experiences from the past and makes room for new memories.